Oke, okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, thanks to joining this uh, ISPG webinar session 22. So, I am Julianta on behalf of ISPG. I'm welcoming all of you to have an uh, excellent technical discussion tonight. So, before we start, I would like to uh, share some update that this is the 22 uh, webinar session made by SPG. The title tonight is Micro Seismic Monitoring for Asset Preservation and Value Optimization. We have a guest speaker, which is uh, Emmanuel Auger, as a senior geophysicist from Baker Hughes, lead scientist. Uh, some short brief about Emma. Emma has a 21 years of experience in uh, geophysics in both the academy and the industry. Emmanuel started his career in R&D, developing software for active and passive seismic data processing. He then moved to a technical advisor role in a team dedicated to the macro seismic mapping of the hydraulic stimulation. And he is now involved in the sales of induced seismicity monitoring services. And Emmanuel holds a PhD in geophysics from the University of Nice. So the time for presentation is one hour, uh, more or less, will be presented by Emma, and then another one hour for Q&A session. So just a reminder to all participants, you can write down the question on the column chat, and then we will discuss it later after finish the presentation. So, Emma, time is yours. I will stop uh, my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for this uh, opportunity to present Microseismic today, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, it's clear. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, two different things uh, today. Uh, they, they are related, but they are a bit different. One is permanent micro seismic monitoring. So it's essentially uh, the micro seismic monitoring of permanent assets, uh, such as uh, underground gas storages or uh, carbon capture and storages. Uh, and another uh, related. Uh, the other service I'm going to present to you is the imaging of the hydraulic uh, fracturing. So first of all, a, a very quick introduction about uh, the mechanism uh, by which micro seismicity occurs. So let's say there is a, an underground activity uh, in which we pump uh, fluid in or out. So it could be uh, geothermal oil and gas production, uh, underground gas storages. Uh, this movement of fluid is going to uh, induce deformation or variations in pore pressure. And uh, this is going to uh, trigger uh, the, the release of uh, stress in the form of uh, seismic events, so uh, small earthquakes. These are going to be recorded by uh, very sensitive seismic sensors uh, essentially geophones or, or, or uh, seismometers. And then through the analysis of the seismic waves, we are going to be able to uh, first detect the occurrence of micro seismic events uh, and then determine the, the position and the time of occurrence. Now, um, one thing we need to be aware of is that uh, micro seismic events uh, occur on a very wide scale of, of energy. And we are typically interested here in what we would call uh, small, small events. So uh, if you think about you know, the earthquakes that uh, occur, the natural earthquakes that, that, that occur and that can be uh, disruptive, uh, these are usually much above the range of seismic events that, that we are uh, looking at. 
So you know that uh, seismic events, the, their energy is measured on, on the magnitude scale, which is a logarithmic scale. And each time the magnitude changes uh, by uh, one, the energy release uh, changes by a factor of uh, 30. So it's, it's an enormous scale. Now, when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, negative magnitude events, uh, so these are typically the, the, the events that we are going to be interested in uh, for this presentation. Uh, they are typically the events uh, associated with hydraulic fracturing monitoring. And the detection of these events is going to be uh, interesting for process control, so optimization of, of production. Uh, when we talk about larger events, so maybe magnitude one or two, uh, we're, we're talking uh, about risk mitigation. So the, the, the potential that these events are going to in some way uh, impact the production uh, or, or the safety of the asset we are, we are monitoring. Um, Okay, so again, uh, two, two main things and two parts in, in this presentation. Uh, the first part is going to be about the permanent uh, monitoring. So uh, the monitoring of large assets uh, such as underground gas storages or, or CCS or oil and gas production. Um, it's typically a, a long-term uh, a long term mission or accomplishment. I mean, we have um, relationship with the clients for uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, we are looking at uh, the scale of the, the reservoir, uh, even larger. And the main focus is on uh, sustainability and the safety of, of the operations. Uh, when we instead we, we look at the, the imaging of the hydraulic fracturing uh, operations, uh, we are looking at, you know, short, short surveys, so typically days uh, or weeks uh, at a small scale, which is the, the, the scale of the well. And here the focus is on uh, the optimization of the production. So we are looking at uh, uh, increasing the, the, the value um, uh, of the operation. Okay, so first I'm going to uh, to show you some case studies about permanent monitoring, and then I will show you, explain to you how we we, we do this monitoring. So by by showing you uh, the services and the the hardware that uh, Baker Hughes uh, offers. So uh, permanent monitoring. The first case study. Uh, I'm going to spend a few slides on it because it, it was a, a complex uh, undertaking. And it's also um, a, a case study in which we deployed uh, several types of uh, micro seismic uh, hardware. So the context is uh, CCS, so that means uh, carbon capture and, and storage. Uh, it's an operation that's lasted for seven years. Uh, we did that for, for Total in uh, Southwest France. Uh, what you see on the right is a, a map of the area, a large scale map, and each dot represents uh, an earthquake. So a naturally occurring earthquake. As you see, this area is uh, pretty seismic. So the first objective uh, for the micro seismic monitoring here was to clearly distinguish uh, between the naturally occurring uh, seismicity and uh, anything that will have, could have been induced uh, by the injection of CO2. Um, what you see in the middle is the second uh, objective. It's, uh, it's a vertical cross section, okay? So uh, depth on, on the y-axis and uh, the gas, um, let's say the reservoir through which the, the CO2, in which the CO2 was injected is this red patch. And as you can see, there are many faults uh, in the reservoir, uh, closing the reservoir and uh, around the reservoir. So this was uh, a source of concern because the, the injection had the potential to uh, reactivate these faults. So the second objective 
was to monitor these faults, uh, and it represents a, a second scale. Uh, well, the first scale was a regional scale. This is, let's say, a local scale uh, within a few kilometers uh, from the project. Then uh, the third objective is uh, shown here on, on the left. So the injection occurred at 4,500 meters, which is, uh, which is quite deep, uh, in a reservoir that had been uh, heavily depleted by gas production before. So this reinjection had the potential uh, to crack the cap rock. And the, the third objective was to closely monitor the integrity of the cap rock. So we had three objectives, uh, three scales. You can see that the last objective is at uh, you know, the reservoir scale. And uh, we deployed three types of micro seismic instrumentation uh, that we are going to see in the, in the next slide. So at the regional scale, uh, remember the challenge uh, was to distinguish between the naturally occurring earthquakes uh, and what could be uh, induced by the project. Uh, what you see here on the, on the right is, is a map with the green symbols representing the, the seismic stations from the National Seismic Survey. And here at the center, you have the project. So what you can see is that there, there was a, a gap in terms of spatial coverage uh, of the National Seismic Survey in the vicinity uh, of the project. So this had the, uh, the potential, um, let's say, disadvantage or issue that uh, a, micro, a natural micro seismic event, uh, sorry, a natural earthquake could be mislocated uh, by the seismic survey because of a lack of accuracy in, in the area of the project. So we had a very easy fix, which uh, consisted in just installing one broadband station um, at the vertical of the project and sharing the data with the National uh, Seismic Survey. And this way we, we avoided the, the pitfall that, uh, you know, we, we locally increased the accuracy of the National uh, Seismic Survey and we avoided uh, the potential issue that uh, a natural event could be mislocated. Uh, then we have the second objective, which, is, uh, which was more interesting, uh, which was to cover the, uh, you know, the real potential reactivation of the faults uh, in the reservoir and around the reservoir. So we addressed uh, this challenge with a different type of equipment, which we called uh, shallow buried arrays. So you can see uh, this uh, in the middle. Each shallow buried array consists of a series of geophones that are uh, deployed, buried, and cemented into shallow wells. So 200 meter wells in, in that case. And the advantage of burying the geophones is that you screen them from the natural or the uh, anthropic noise, you know, noise induced by human activities at the surface. And doing this, you increase a lot the capacity of these geophones to, de uh, to detect small micro seismic events. Um, plus, they are relatively inexpensive because it's a water well technology, it's not oil and gas well technology. So we deployed these uh, shallow build arrays, uh, seven of, of them, uh, within a radius of two to three kilometers uh, around the project. And with these, uh, we could monitor the potential reactivation of the forms. Uh, now let's go to the third objective and the third scale, which was to monitor the, the integrity of the cap rock. So Total deployed, uh, based on our advice, uh, a deep uh, borehole instrument uh, based on fiber optics with the three geophones uh, at the, the depth of the target, so 4,500 meters. And because these geophones were so close to the injection and so close to the reservoir, they were able to uh, detect these very, very small uh, micro seismic events uh, occurring in the reservoir and potentially occurring in the cap rock. Uh, now, something I haven't said, but um, that, that, that is worth uh, noting is that we are looking at into, you know, very small micro seismic events. 
a magnitude minus two a micro seismic event has the energy release of a water bottle uh, falling from a table. So very, very small, uh, very small energy. And to detect, of course, this kind of micro seismic events, uh, you need specific uh, equipment and you, you need uh, this equipment to these to be deployed very close to the reservoir. Uh, this slide uh, sums up the results of uh, seven years of monitoring. Um, each dot represents a micro seismic event. On the, the x axis, you have distance uh, from the injection well. And on the y axis, you have the magnitude of the events. Okay. And each event is color coded uh, according to the uh, where it was located and by which type of instrumentation it was detected. So the green events were detected by the deep uh, borehole uh, instrument close to the reservoir. The red dots correspond to micro seismic events occurring uh, in the faults, on the faults in and around the reservoir. And these were detected by the network of, uh, of shallow buried arrays. And then we have these uh, blue blue events corresponding to regional uh, regional events detected by the seismic survey, national seismic survey, uh, plus uh, our, our broadband sensor. Um, so looking at the at the regional events, uh, these are of course the less interested. We we detected a, a lot of them, uh, thanks to um, the, the broadband station that we deployed. Uh, none of them were erroneously located uh, in the in the project. So the the, the first objective was uh, was meant. Now, if we go at uh, at the you know the red dots, uh, where these were these were the as I say the events occurring on the fort. So we're going to go into a bit more detail uh, on them. Um, and, and then we have had so many of these uh, green events, so very very tiny events uh, occurring in the reservoir. That's, that's seven years of, of data. Uh, so let's go into a bit more uh, detail for the Caprock integrity results. So these are the events occurring in the reservoir detected by the, the deep borehole array. And you can see on the right here, this, this is a map. Um, so all the events occur within less than one kilometer from, from the injection point. Um, what you can see from this diagram is that there was also a clear progression uh, as time was passing by, the, the events were always uh, further away from the injection point. So we, we, we saw uh, the plume of CO2 uh, propagating in, into the, the depleted reservoir. Uh, what was very important for, for Total, for the operator, is uh, this, this result on the depth of the events, so which is shown on, on the middle diagram. On the, the x-axis, you have uh, the total number of events. And on the y-axis, you have the depth of the events, with the injection point uh, being this, uh, this green dot. Now, you see that most of the events, like probably 95% of them, were occurring within the reservoir. And very, very few of them uh, above the reservoir in, in the cap rock. So, the conclusion was that the, the cap rock was not being cracked by the reinjection of CO2 and, and that the, the CO2 containment was, was safe. So, it was, it was uh, the first important result uh, for, for this project. Um, let, let's go to the other uh, result that uh, triggered quite uh, a lot of, um, let's say, interest uh, for, for this project, which are the, the seismic events um, occurring on the forts uh, within, an, I mean, be, between the reservoir and, and the town of Po here in, in the north, uh, north and east. Uh, we detected 60, uh, 67 events uh, during seven years. Uh, now, these are usually small events about, uh, you know, magnitude zero events, but a few of these were uh, almost magnitude two. And these are the, the three events uh, pointed here um, by the black arrow on this diagram. Uh, the issue was that these three events were felt by the population of Po, 
and this triggered let's say quite uh, a lot of alarm and um, a lot of scrutiny uh, on the project by the, the local administration so of course uh, one question was uh, are these events uh, triggered or induced by by the injection or is it just uh, you know related to, to something else so this question of course was very important to to total uh, if we look at this diagram on, on the left, we have time on the x-axis. Uh, it's almost uh, seven years of monitoring. And then on the y-axis, on the blue y-axis, we have the total cumulated volume of uh, injecting, injecting CO2, this curve. And then we have the magnitude of the events. So we, these uh, yellow events are the ones occurring on, on the forms. And the small, uh, uh, the small red events here are those occurring in the reservoir. So clearly, there is a, a, an increase of seismicity occurring uh, as the injection uh, progresses. Now, what was very important for Total is that they started the monitoring. We started the monitoring uh, much before the, the injection here. Okay, so uh, for one year there was there was uh, monitoring. We did detect a few events, uh, two of them, uh, without any injection. So that was one, uh, let's say, uh, a reason for Total to to say um, to argue that the you know the micro seismicity was not uh, induced by uh, by the injection. Um, so the, the lesson we, we we draw from from this uh, this pilot is that. Um, it's, it's very important to get a long baseline before you start an injection. So you should start your monitoring uh, well in advance um, to, to, to be able to better understand the seismicity uh, that could occur during the injection or during your operation. And also uh, the other lesson we learned is that the shadow buried arrays provide you know, very reliable coverage uh, for long periods of time. So they are very adapted to um, monitoring long-term objectives such as uh, carbon capture and storages, underground gas storages, or uh, in permanent activities, for example, like geothermal. Okay, um, so I spent quite a few slides on, on this case study. Uh, now I'm going to show uh, other quick you know, case studies, but uh, much quicker, just to show you uh, a broad, uh, let's say, view of what uh, micro seismic can be used to. So here we are totally changing uh, the industrial com uh, context. Um, this is micro seismic monitoring we did for uh, a customer in Italy uh, that mines uh, salt. So uh, they mine a very shallow salt layer uh, through leaching, which consists in circulating water between two wells. The, the water then dissolves the salt and, and is produced as, as, uh, as brine. Uh, because the salt water is so shallow, uh, sometimes the, the, the process uh, leads to sinkholes, as you can see here on, on, on the left which of course is a concern for, for HSNE. Um, in, in the middle, you can you see the solution that we implemented for this customer, which consists in a real time, totally automatic micro seismic detection and processing and visualization in, in the control room. So uh, the, the customer had this kind of visualization uh, permanently in their, in their control room. And uh, the main uh, panel of which is a map here with each dot representing a micro seismic event. So the, the, the gray dots represent all the micro seismic events. So events older than 48 hours, while the, the, the green dots, the, the pink dots and the red dots represent um, uh, uh, micro seismic events occurring uh, more recently. So we reached a quite a, you know, a level of integration with the, with the customer in which the workers before driving to the field to a particular location in the field uh, would uh, enter the control room, check on the, the micro seismic visualization, 
uh, and see if there if there were any uh, micro seismic activity in, in the zone they were supposed to work in uh, before before the draw. And uh, then in a few cases, as you can see on the right, uh, we could also predict the occurrence of uh, sinkholes. So in a few uh, in a few cases, we could see uh, these micro seismic events occurring, uh, you know, even at an even higher rate and also progressing upwards. That's what you, you see here on these uh, 3D maps. So when we saw that, we, we, we you know, alerted the client that there, there would probably be a, a sinkhole uh, within a, a short time frame. Uh, the value, of course, for, for the, the customer here was the general improvement of uh, HSNE conditions. Uh, another case study, so we are changing uh, context totally. Um, this is gas production uh, for the Groningen gas field, which uh, used to be the largest uh, gas field in continental Europe, uh, sorry, Western Europe. Um, the, the gas production uh, there, uh, unfortunately, triggered very large uh, induced seismicity, typically uh, magnitude three, four um, events that started um, damaging buildings. So the production was stopped uh, because of the of the social uh, you know, the social acceptance uh, issue. Um, now, the, what was seen is that the, the induced seismicity was growing in terms of uh, event rate, but also in terms of magnitude. So at some point, the government asked, "Okay, so what is now the maximum?" Uh, you know, the maximum magnitude that uh, uh, an induced seismic event could have uh, on the grinding and gas field. And to answer this question, um, the operator had to know uh, what was the maximum reasonable fault dimension, fault length associated with induced seismicity. And in particular, they had to know whether the seismicity occurred within the reservoir, in that case, the you know the fault length could could only be rather limited and the maximum expected magnitude could only be about four or whether the micro seismic events uh, were occurring also below the reservoir and in that case the, the the maximum fault length could be much larger and therefore the maximum magnitude could be uh, even magnitude six or seven which is uh, extremely uh, destructive. So we were hired by, by NAM um, actually to answer this question, what was the, the precise depth of the, the micro seismic events uh, occurring in the gas field. So we deployed uh, these uh, two permanent uh, wireline instruments uh, separated by, by about two to three kilometers. So geophones, uh, wireline geophones, uh, typical from VSP acquisition. Uh, the difference is that we, we left them uh, for uh, a few years in, continu in continuous acquisition, and we detected uh, more than 500 events. Um, we also uh, developed uh, you know, uh, specific processing techniques to have a very accurate uh, depth determination. And then we were able to show that uh, all, all the seismicity was confined uh, within the reservoir. Okay, so it means that uh, the maximum expected uh, magnitude from the induced seismicity was only about four. Uh, and that was, uh, let's say, reassuring for uh, the Dutch government. Um, okay, another totally different context, and uh, that's almost my last case study. Um, this is uh, offshore uh, in, in the North Sea. Uh, it's a job we, we did uh, for MESC. So they had this uh, completion strategy uh, by which they would uh, have intermeshed producer and in injector wells, with the injector wells being these uh, you know, blue, blue wells and the producer wells being these green wells. And uh, because the, the, the chalk um, that constitutes the reservoir is, is not permeable, uh, they, had they had to stimulate the, the wells, the, uh, the injector wells. 
Now, the geomechanical studies had predicted that uh, the fractures would develop a parallel to the well, so like this, which would allow the water to push efficiently the DOI to the producer wells. But still, uh, MERSC wanted to have a, a double check with uh, you know, hard data on uh, the direction of the fractures uh, developing from, uh, from the, the stimulations. So we permanently monitor the seismicity for uh, two and a half years uh, during several of these uh, stimulations. Uh, the results, you can see it here on, on, the, on the right, um, was that the, the cracks and, and the fractures actually develop totally, uh, I mean, orthogonally to the well, so totally differently from what the geomechanical studies had, had predicted. And, and this was a very serious uh, problem for MERSC. Uh, because when we create fractures like this, you potentially create short circuits um, between the, the, the injector wells here and the producer wells here. So it's the exact opposite of, uh, of what they, they, they wanted to attain. Uh, and therefore they revised their, the, totally their completion uh, strategy as a result of the micro seismic uh, monitoring. Okay, so my last uh, case study, uh, it's uh, again a, a totally different application and, and environment. Uh, this is underground gas storages in, uh, in salt layer in, in the UK, so called EDF Energy. Now the situation is that uh, EDF Energy had bought these uh, salt caverns, you can see the outline here, that had been uh, drilled by a previous company for salt mining. And they wanted to convert these, uh, these caverns uh, for storing uh, hydrocarbons. The challenge was that uh, some of these um, caverns had been created too close one to another. So two of them had already merged uh, and collapsed uh, one into the other. Uh, and anyway, the other ones were, were very close one to the other. So for the conversion uh, from salt mining to underground gas storages in the first years, uh, they had to monitor very closely the integrity of, of the walls between the adjacent caverns. So we put in place um, a, a very, um, let's say, uh, specific a micro seismic monitoring that is called a, a traffic light system. Uh, it's a series of procedures such as every time uh, that a micro seismic parameter is exceeded, then there is a specific action from, from the customer. So for example, if there is a magnitude uh, minus one event in, in, in close to one cavern, then they're going, for example, to reduce the, the storage pressure. So some things like that. And uh, after two years of this uh, traffic line system, um, we were able to show, I mean, EDF Energy was able to show that the conversion from salt mining to um, underground gas storage was, was safe. And then they started the second phase of the micro seismic monitoring, um, which consists in uh, determining what is the maximum uh, operating pressure for the caverns as well as the maximum injection rates and, and withdrawal rates. So currently uh, they have already um, you know, reached uh, uh, some results. So they have uh, increased the, 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 the injection withdrawal rates uh, based on their geomechanical studies and based on the micro seismic monitoring. And, and we are currently working with them on, on the rest. So on determining the, the safe, uh, the maximum safe uh, storing pressure. Okay, so um, how how can this? Uh, I, I show I show a few case studies. Uh, now I'm going to go into uh, a bit more detail uh, about um, you know the services and the instrumentation that uh, are required to to attain uh, these objectives. So. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip this slide, which is a bit commercial, but uh, 
what logically, uh, you know, a, a micro seismic monitoring would start with uh, the network design. Okay, so a customer comes with a, a micro, you know, micro seismic problem or, or a series of objectives, and then you need to determine uh, what is the, the best uh, and the most cost efficient uh, micro seismic uh, set of equipment that is going to meet, uh, meet their needs. Uh, then you need to procure the equipment, uh, install it, uh, and, and maintain it. And then you need, of course, to do the data processing, uh, the reporting, uh, and sometimes the traffic light system. So uh, let, let's go into the, the network design. So what does this consist in? As I said, uh, you, you're going to listen to, to the customer's objectives, and then you're going to translate that into specifications in terms of micro seismic, uh, micro seismic monitoring. So for example, uh, the customer says, okay, I have a, an underground gas storage, or let's say I have a geothermal operation, um, and I, I want to monitor that uh, there is no uh, force reactivation due to this uh, geothermal operation. So uh, we, we're going to consider a, a lot of um, let's say conditions, local conditions and constraints. So for example, the position of the fonts, uh, the land occupation, the geology, the velocity model. And then we're going to say uh, to the customer, okay, we did, uh, you know, we did the, the modeling, the wave field modeling uh, to monitor these objectives, you need to reach, uh, to, you need to detect all you know, magnitude minus one events in, in this uh, volume. And to attain this objective, you need, for example, uh, three shallow bird arrays uh, at this depth and more or less uh, at this location. So, so that's the, the network design. And then, uh, of course, then you need to uh, procure the equipment and, and install it. So um, here I'm reviewing some, let's say, current, uh, well, uh, common equipment uh, for permanent micro seismic monitoring. Again, it's permanent, so everything needs to be uh, well permanent. So it, it, it's not temporary instrumentation, such as VSP or uh, what we deploy for hydraulic fracturing. Um, we we deploy in terms of sensors. We we can deploy uh, array, you know seismometers uh, at the surface, and this would be typically for large uh, regional events. Uh, then we can deploy shallow build arrays, so these geophones are uh, cemented into shallow wells. And this would be very nice, for example, to monitor the reactive, reactivation of faults uh, around the project. And then in some cases, we can deploy uh, wireline borehole arrays uh, when we need to get very close to, uh, for example, an ejection point to monitor the uh, integrity of a cap rock, or if we want to uh, measure maybe you know the the, uh, the direction of the micro seismic events from a, a geo geothermal stimulation. At the surface, typically you will find this type of equipment, uh, which is autonomous, uh, unsupervised, uh, autonomous in terms of power, typically with the solar panels and autonomous in terms of communication with uh, 3G or 4G modems and sometimes uh, satellite communication. Uh, this equipment, of course, needs to be uh, very reliable uh, because this, this is meant to be uh, permanent. Uh, this is going to be um, you know, installed in locations that might be remote or not close to uh, a wellhead, so you, you can't go there every every um, every day to, to, to fix the equipment. So we, we, we reach typically a high level of reliability and, and uh, this equipment typically works for years uh, without any supervision and without any, any maintenance. Uh, the processing. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of processing uh, that you can find on the market. You can find uh, very, uh, let's say, sophisticated, detect, you know, dedicated processing, such as the one um, we, we, uh, we developed for NAM to precisely determine the depth of the, uh, the events in, in the Groningen gas field. 
so you have like you know these uh, PhDs uh, developing software methodologies uh, just just for for one project. Uh, on the other end, end of the spectrum, you can have uh, fully automatic processing and, and reporting. Uh, it's available on the market, and it's typically when you need, uh, let's say, a, a rough estimate of the, the micro seismic activity, uh, not very accurate results, but uh, let's say fast and, and, and cheap results. Uh, th this is a typical, uh, this is a reporting interface, so uh, you can you know, have several types of visualization. Uh, so you have map visualization, 3D visualization, uh, you can have time timeline uh, visualization, and then you can uh, do some operations on, on the micro seismic database, uh, such as a cross plots or histograms. Okay. Uh, and then one thing uh, which I think is very important uh, on which we, we are uh, you know, putting a lot of focus at Baker Hughes is the integration of micro seismic with uh, other disciplines, uh, in particular uh, ge geomechanics. So um, there's a lot of value uh, to use micro seismic monitoring to calibrate and validate uh, geomechanical models. And I will just give you one example uh, of a job we did uh, for, for a customer in Holland. It's an underground gas storage. So there was, there was a geomechanical study. Uh, and then we used the, uh, we used the micro seismic observation uh, and the geomechanics to predict that in some parts of the feed, uh, the, the gas could be stored at a higher pressure without causing induced seismicity, so without reacting with any of the faults. And instead that on the other side of the fault, the, the, the storing pressure had, had to be decreased. So again, the combination of geomechanics and micro seismic uh, can be used to optimize production, uh, I think in several industrial contexts. So we've seen that uh, for the conversion of uh, salt mining to, uh, to gas storages, we have seen this, uh, as I was just saying now, uh, for underground gas storages in, in depleted fields. And I think we can also uh, use this for, for geothermal uh, to optimize the, uh, let's say, the stimulations. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, which is not very important. Um, so that, that was uh, what I had to show about permanent monitoring. Uh, the rest of the presentation, which is, which is shorter, is dedicated to uh, the imaging of the hydraulic fracturing. So it's a totally different application of micro seismic. Um, in, in terms of science, it's almost the same in terms of uh, you know, codes, uh, pro, you know, uh, processing, it's almost the same because it's always the same waves, the, the same uh, natural events uh, or induced events. Uh, now, the, the main difference is, is that when you uh, permanent monitoring, it's a very long relationship with the customers. It lasts uh, maybe for 10 or 20 years. And it's mainly, not only, but it's mainly uh, focused on preserving the assets. So, uh, the, 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 the focus is on the integrity. Uh, now, for hydraulic fracturing monitoring, it's quite the opposite. So these are very short operations, uh, days or weeks, uh, short, uh, short relationship with the customer. And the focus is on optimizing the, the frag program. So let's uh, first review the acquisition methodologies to do this uh, hydraulic fracturing um, uh, imaging. And when I say hydraulic fracturing, it, it's, you know, it's exactly the same uh, for geothermal stimulation. Uh, it's always uh, water that is injected uh, and you need to determine the direction uh, in which the, 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 the faults or, or the, the cracks are, are, are created. So you have uh, three different technologies available to do this uh, acquisition of uh, hydraulic fracturing imaging. Uh, the first, which is almost, I would say, the standard, like is probably 95% of the, of the frag jobs, which I image this way, is with a, a temporary uh, downhole uh, wireline array. 
So typically a, a VSP tool, uh, which is going to be installed in a dedicated monitoring well, uh, not from not far from the frac, and at a depth uh, similar to, to the frac itself. Uh, you have a second technology, which is the, the surface array. So it consists in deploying uh, a lot uh, of geophones at the surface. Uh, this equipment comes from land seismic uh, acquisition, so active seismic. And it's the preferred methodology uh, when you don't have any monitoring well uh, available to do, uh, to do the first technology. And then there's a third technology, which is um, pretty much confidential. It's used only uh, for a few jobs. Uh, it's the shallow buried array. So you, you cement, you install, and you cement these uh, geophones in, into shallow wells. Uh, and you can ask, okay, why am I uh, installing uh, permanent geophones to monitor um, you know, a temporary frac? Well, the idea is that um, you're going to have to refrag the wells. So we, we know that for shale gas, uh, you know, tank gas, the production of the fracked wells um, decreases very sharply with, with time. So every few years, you, you have to refrag the same wells. So the idea here is that you, you invest in a, in a network of shadow buried arrays at the beginning uh, and then you can reuse the same arrays uh, to monitor the frags, um, you know, for several years, for several cycles, I would say. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into this detail. And I'm going to skip directly to the case studies for uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing imaging. Uh, it's, uh, it's only three case studies. Um, so the first one is um, with a, it's actually a surface um, imaging. So we deployed the geophones into what we call dispatches here. So this is a map view. So here you have the well trajectory. So this is North America, uh, probably Canada or, or the US. They have these very long laterals uh, that, that need to be, to be fracked. Um, the geophones are grouped into what we call uh, patches. So you can see here this group of points, each point uh, represents uh, a, a, a trace. So it actually represents 24 uh, geophones stacked together. A patch is about uh, 50 meter per 50 meter. And then they are uh, deployed over this quite large area, you know, five kilometers by, by three kilometers to provide a good angle coverage uh, for the micro seismic events. So we deployed here for this job, we deployed uh, almost uh, 20,000 uh, geophones uh, for a total of uh, 800 traces and, and 39 patches. So you could say, could say, oh, why, why, why do we need so, so many geophones? Uh, the deal is that at the surface, there is uh, quite much more noise than on, on downhole arrays. So you need to overcome this, uh, this, this noise. Plus you are typically further away from the frac uh, compared to, to downhole, downhole arrays. So you're typically two kilometer or three kilometer away uh, fr from the fronts. So because you have a low level of signal and then a high level of noise, uh, the only way to overcome this low signal is to noise level is by increasing the number uh, of measurement points or so the number of geophones and then use, um, let's say, pretty sophisticated uh, processing techniques. Uh, we detected a, a lot of micro seismic events, so about 72,000 uh, uh, micro seismic events. And this in my view is the result. So each dot here represents a micro seismic event. It's color coded uh, according to time elapsed. So of course the frag starts with the, the heel of the, of the well here, and then it progresses uh, towards, the, towards the, no, sorry, it starts at the two of the well here, and then it progresses towards the, the heel of, of the wells. So there is a direction which is uh, pretty clear. It's almost no uh, 45 degrees. And it's not quite the optimal 
uh, with respect to the orientation of the wells. Uh, typically, you would want the, the, the fracture to develop exactly orthogonally to the well. So this was the first result of this study is that uh, they, they didn't pick the exact optimum location, uh, optimum orientation for drilling the wells. Uh, and then there was also, which it's not very clear in this picture, but it will be uh, clearer after, there is also a, a large amount of fault reactivation, especially here uh, at the two of the wells. So I'm zooming here on the results obtained at, at the two of the wells. Uh, these symbols uh, represent the so-called uh, beach balls. So these are the focal, mecha focal mechanism of the micro seismic events, and they are a, a representation of the P wave radiation uh, that gave rise to the micro seismic event. And it gives you uh, an idea on, on the crack orientation on which the, the micro seismic event uh, was, was created. So here, what you can see here, for example, is all very consistent with the North 45 uh, frag direction. You have the, 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 the cracks with almost the same orientation. It's these, uh, um, let's say, black, uh, uh, black lines. But here, something, uh, something different happens. You can see a, a totally different direction. And this is typical of when you, have a, you are reactivating a, a fault. Uh, reactivating a fault is a problem doing hydraulic fracturing for two reasons. Uh, one is that you are wasting your, your, your sand and your water in, into the fault instead of creating uh, small cracks uh, in, into the formation. And the second problem is that it has the potential to induce uh, really large uh, micro seismic events. Um, when you plot this diagram, so this diagram is a distribution of uh, magnitude, okay? So it's a, a magnitude frequency uh, diagram. So here you have uh, the smaller events. You see we detected uh, down to magnitude minus three, which is really good, uh, up to magnitude zero. Magnitude zero events are, are, are quite large uh, for, for frac. And this slope here uh, tells you the proportion of uh, small events to large events. So there are always uh, many more small events, but when you are creating small cracks, which is the desired outcome of the hydraulic fracturing, you really have many, many, many more small events uh, rather than large events. And this slope here, the slope of this, uh, uh, this distribution indicated that there, there weren't uh, as many uh, small events uh, as expected. So this is another proof that there was a serious uh, fault reactivation uh, going on uh, during this uh, hydraulic fracture. Okay, uh, the second, and uh, it's almost the last case study for uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing imaging. Uh, this is with a shallow buried array. So you remember this is uh, the, the, the third uh, technology that you can use to monitor a frag. So there were uh, 93 shallow buried arrays. Uh, it's uh, represented by these um, uh, black triangles. And uh, it's uh, in Canada, in, in, the, in Montney, a Montney formation, which uh, triggers a lot of uh, seismicity. Uh, with a that target depth of uh, 3,500 meters, which is uh, quite deep. Uh, the results are here. And okay, so he, this, this is the well here. Uh, on a, This is a map view, easting uh, and nothing. This is the map, uh, this is, sorry, this is the well trajectory, uh, the horizontal well. Each uh, perforation shot is represented by, by this triangle. So what you would expect and what uh, you know you would like if you're a geo operator is to see uh, the cracks, the fractures propagating uh, orthogonally to the well and possibly uh, symmetrically from, from the well. Instead, we obtain a totally different results. Okay, so uh, there, there are lots of micro seismic events, 
but they are not that micro seismic. I mean, they are also, they're almost earthquakes. So very strong events uh, occurring on structures that clearly have uh, no relationship with uh, the creation of, uh, of cracks, uh, of fractures in, in, in the formation. So this is really um, a, a typical example of large fault reactivation. Uh, a magnitude 4.1 uh, was, uh, was induced and this triggered the uh, mandatory interruption of the, of the operations by, by the government. Okay, uh, and then the last case study, uh, it's for downhaul uh, with, it was obtained with uh, downhaul equipment. So you remember this is the, uh, the most, uh, let's say common technology to monitor frags. Um, I'm going to zoom on just one particular stage uh, of a hydraulic frag. Um, these dots, uh, sorry, these uh, squares, these yellow squares represent uh, a perforation, a casing perforation. So um, maybe you're not familiar with uh, hydraulic fracturing, but first you drill the well and then to inject the water uh, and the sand, you need to perforate the well with a casing perforation shots. And during the hydraulic fracturing, you're going to inject the water uh, one perforation cluster at a time. So about uh, three, uh, three perforations uh, at a time. Of course, what you want to see, um, and, and this was a real time micro seismic monitoring, uh, what, what you want to see is, is a nice frac deploying uh, on each side of the uh, of the well uh, and possibly going uh, as far as possible. But you want to check that each uh, perforation is, is used uh, to create fractures. So this is a video. I'm not sure if it's going to, uh, uh, if you're going to be able to really see it with the, the lag um, of the communication, but let's try. So each dot is a micro seismic event here. So you can see on, on, on the on the left hand side uh, the micro seismic events propagating uh, from the perforation shots. Here we are in the middle of uh, of the, the treatment of the stage. Okay, and this is the end of the stage. So this was obtained uh, after the stage uh, and these results were uh, provided in real time to, to the customer. Now the frack engineer uh, wasn't very happy about the results uh, because it shows that uh, only three uh, perforation shots were actually um, efficient in, in, in this uh, hydraulic fracturing. So like the, the three uh, southernmost perforation shots were not uh, were not being used uh, for the for the frac. So the frac was not propagating, and the water was not entering from this perforation shot, and was not creating uh, fractures here in, in the southern part. So what they used is a, a diverter. So it's a kind of slurry that uh, temporarily. Um, um, how do you say that? Uh, taps or blocks the, the 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 top the top perforations, and it constrains the water into uh, entering the three southernmost uh, uh, southernmost perforations. But still, um, they they had to check that that the, the process was, was efficient. So we did the monitoring again of, of the next stage. And that's the the last slide. So again, it's a video. Uh, starting it now. Again, you see the micro seismic events uh, as they are occurring. And by comparing uh, this slide with the previous slide, you can see that the, the diversion was partially successful. So they succeeded in, in using at least a few uh, of the perforation shots that uh, before had been uh, had been inefficient. Okay, so the conclusion is that the real-time microseismic monitoring 
Uh, this is another example of how it can be used to uh, optimize your, your, your FRAC process. Okay, uh, and the last slide uh, of the presentation is that um, you, you will get the most value uh, of uh, hydraulic fracturing monitoring if you combine it with uh, our other methodologies, uh, other types of modeling. So for example, this is an illustration in which we, we compared the, 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 the results we obtained from uh, hydraulic fracturing monitoring on, on, on the right side. Uh, with the model, the front model that had been uh, drawn previously by, by uh, our, let's say our software. So in that case, you see that there is a fairly good agreement. Uh, in, in, the, in the bottom case, there's a very, very good agreement um, between, at least in terms of the height of the, of the frag, there's a very good agreement between uh, the results of the micro seismic monitoring and, and what the uh, let's say what the model predicted. So you can see that the, the model is, is a very good uh, representation of the reality. Uh, instead, in, in that case, uh, it's clear that there is a problem. And so like the, this first uh, seismic swarm is, is you know, quite consistent with the model, but what the model uh, did not uh, predict is the occurrence of this uh, uh, these events here are much much above. So clearly, in that case, you you need to go back and, and improve the modeling to to take into account these uh, these results. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm I'm open to to questions. Okay, thanks, Emma. Uh, this is very insightful presentation. So before going to the Q and A session. I would like to uh, introduce uh, our moderator. Uh, let me uh, share screen. So I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the discussion will be moderated by Dr. Anat uh, Andri Hendriana, STMP. Is a lecturer from Institute of Technology Bandung, from Seismology Exploration and uh, Rekayasa, Kelompok Kalian. Yeah. So, Dr. Andri graduated from Bandung Institute of Technology, uh, Bachelor, S2, Master Degree in ITB, and uh, PhD in Universitas Potsdam, Jerman. So, I would like to invite Mas Andri and to all participants, if you have any question, you can uh, write down on the column chat. So I have uh, the first question before before maybe somebody will, will uh, have any question. So from the slide, that the last two slides that you're showing, can we say that from the micro uh, micro seismic, we can get a 70, 80 uh, percent result if we don't have any like uh, geomodeling or another another additional uh, method that you send to us. Um, so can, can you repeat your question? Can we have the 70, 80? Yeah, I mean, can we get like a fr from from the result? We we will have a, like a 70, 80 percent result already align within the trend from this uh, hydraulic fracturing example that you shown to us from the last two slides. Maybe you can come back to the slide. Yes. Uh, but it's still considering the far field stress. Am I right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, Very interesting, yeah. Uh, typically, what you can get from hydraulic fracturing uh, monitoring, and uh, it's uh, you know the, the first uh, usually the, the first information, the, the most basic information, it's the the height, the length, uh, uh, and the azimuth. Yeah. So that that is uh, the first information that is uh, seeked from microseismic monitoring. 
Uh, and then uh, the second objective usually is to monitor the, you know, the potential reactivation of fronts. Yeah, so in this case, assuming we only have a micro seismic uh, uh, tools, we don't have any any another modeling or example, any other uh, uh, sophisticated uh, image log or, or sonic. Can we still use uh, to, to predict this, uh, this fracture length and then the fracture propagation by only using a micro seismic? Uh, yes, yes. So you can, uh, I mean, you can compute uh, what they, they call the stimulated reservoir volume from the distribution of micro seismic events. So you, you make the assumption that the, the micro seismic events, uh, the cloud, uh, represents the the connected fractures. Uh, so uh, the connected fractures are, are those fractures in which for which there is a direct communication uh, to to the well. So it's the fractures that are eventually going to contribute to the, the increased production of the well. Okay, thanks, Emma. And then my second question is about. Uh, can you come back to slide number uh, 39? Uh, come back to what, sorry? Can you say slide again? number 39. 39, this one. Yes. Okay, yeah, this is interesting. So my question is, so before we do this uh, micro seismic uh, analysis, do we do like uh, some, some predictive the direction of this uh, this this uh, fault. I mean, uh, it's um, like a predictive uh, predictive uh, fault, and then the, the actual result. And then we can we see any any difference? Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the customer did uh, b before the frack. Um, it's a pretty sophisticated customer, so I'm, I'm sure that they had done uh, 3D seismic. So probably they had identified uh, the, these fonts, uh, but usually for uh, frac, uh, you know, uh, tight gas operations, they, they don't do a lot of uh, geomechanical uh, studies, not, not that I know of, actually. So uh, the reactivation of these faults was, was uh, I think, a total surprise for them. Okay. Okay, interesting. So the client here, they have already uh, full, uh, complete 3D seismic data, maybe. Yeah, that's what you mentioned. Yes. So probably they had identified the faults on, mm -hmm. on the 3D, uh, but they didn't know they didn't know that they would be reactivated uh, with such uh, you know such a force. I mean, this was a pretty catastrophic result for for them, uh, as you can see. Uh, from the side, they, they did not create any uh, useful fracture, so they did not increase the production on, on the well. Uh, instead, they, they wasted the uh, you know the propent and the water into uh, these large fonts, uh, and they really triggered uh, a seismicity that was so huge that uh, the government stopped the operations. But this is an extreme case. It's the only you know it's the only case uh, that I know of. In, in which uh, hydro refracturing was uh, was stopped because of induced seismicity. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, thanks, Emma. Yeah. Thank you for our questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now time for Q and A. Uh, please, Kang Andri, you can uh, open mic and then lead the Q and A session. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for <laughs> inviting me actually. And actually it, uh, a couple of minutes ago, I had another meeting. Maybe uh, you, you can, because some somebody also raised hand, maybe uh, now uh, I respect because I respect the raise hand. Maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have a question, yeah? Maybe you, you can address Address your question directly, uh, Mr. Arisabekti, to, to Emma. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mas Andri. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a very good presentation and uh, it's quite uh, new for me. Was the micro seismic uh, and in my uh, I'm Ari from Medco Energy in 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 Bangkanai, Kerendan Field, and it's actually uh, we also get uh, have a plan to do the uh, fracturing on next year. So probably just want to to if 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 this is uh, a good uh, tool, uh, how is how how is the sequence? Whether we we do the micro seismic first and then we do fracturing or or uh, or, or what? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, uh, I think uh, how how do we deploy the the tools, the geophone, for for this kind of uh, uh, monitoring of the fracturing? That's my question. Thank you, Emma. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Um, so, um, I would say, first of all, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we uh, I mean, Baker Hughes or any other um, provider would uh, study your, let's say, your, not your problem, but your, your, your project. Uh, and then uh, together we can decide on, on which is the equipment that is most adapted to your case. Um, typically, if you have um, monitoring wells that are available, then probably you're going to choose the, uh, the downhole monitoring because it's the most uh, frequent. Uh, you need to have uh, an observation well that is uh, within 500 meters uh, from the well you're going to treat, to, to process. Uh, and then um, we, we're going to see if we have a, a tool available in, in the country. Uh, the, the second phase of, uh, of, this, uh, of the operation is that we're going to determine the optimal uh, depth of, of deployment for the tool, you know, so depending on, on the depth of the frack, uh, depending on the velocity model and several uh, so, so several constraints that there is a, an optimal depth of deployment, so which is going to be uh, determined by what we call a, a design study, which involves um, um, wave field propagation, wave field simulation. Uh, and then we're going to install the equipment. If it's downhole, we are going to install it maybe, uh, you know, half a day uh, before the, the inject injection starts. Uh, you, you may want to, to have real-time results. In that case, we're going to equip the truck with uh, communication equipment, uh, screens, and, and uh, we're going to have you know, personal people in the truck uh, processing the results as the, the frack is, is, um, is progressing. So that, that would be for the, the downhole. The, the other option, if, for example, you don't have any uh, monitoring um, monitoring well available, it would be the surface equipment. So the, 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 the surface monitoring option. Um, in, in that case, uh, we, we're going to find um, a seismic acquisition company. Uh, so uh, typically a local company. Uh, again, we're going to go through a design phase in which we will study uh, which is the best uh, location for the, the geophones at, at the surface. So it depends on lots of constraints, but, uh, you know, typically uh, land ownership and land occupation. Uh, and the deployment in that case is, uh, is longer. It typically takes a week because it's, it's a lot of equipment. So, I mean, um, typically 30,000 30, geophones. Uh, in that case, also the results can be provided in, in, in real time. Uh, usually after the real time results, uh, there is also a reprocessing in which we, we improve on you know, the results that were obtained in, in real time. Um, so th does that answer your questions? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so how long if uh, we want to have the result until the, the processing? After the real time, oh. how long do we expect to have that result? 
Oh, so during the real time, uh, mm -hmm. you have the results within uh, one minute. Okay. Uh, and after that, reprocess the... Yeah. And for the reprocessing, it's going, uh, it depends on the type of reprocessing that you want, but it's typically going to uh, last weeks. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it really depends on the size of your job. Uh, like, you know, we, 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 we do uh, enormous jobs in, in Canada, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in which data acquisition lasts for uh, weeks. So in that case, the reprocessing can, can last for one or two months, but also because they want very sophisticated uh, reprocessing. But, um, you know, for a short operation, if you have a, a vertical well with uh, uh, two or three stages, uh, this is going to take uh, one or two weeks for the reprocessing. Okay. So if, uh, I mean, uh, if the, uh, uh, the, 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 the overall process is, will, will be the same as the frack itself. It, it will not be, uh, because it's real time and then you, you can get the processing like uh, in the two weeks time. That's, that's the, the point of the micro seismic. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that's correct. So what, what is the reason for reprocessing? Uh, if you want, for example, more sophisticated information, uh, typically, if you want the focal mechanisms, uh, these are not provided in, in real time. Uh, plus, during the reprocessing, uh, we may also um, do, for example, you know, magnitude distribution uh, info information like this. This uh, this slide, this can be done on, only as a reprocessing, of course, because you you need to. Uh, compile, you, you need to, uh, it's an analysis that depends on the world seismic catalog. So you can do it only uh, as a reprocessing. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so well, my last question, uh, sorry if it is a bit long. Uh, do we do the feasibility study first or it's guaranteed that it will, it will work in the carbonate uh, fracturing or we have to do the uh, feasibility for, for the, uh, the rocks and whether we can get the signal or not, uh, how it is going. Um, okay, well, first, uh, I think we should call this a design study. Um, so like we design what we think is the best network. Uh, unfortunately, we can never really anticipate uh, whether a micro seismic monitoring is going to be successful. Uh, the main driver uh, of success uh, is the formation itself. So we know that there are some formations that uh, trigger a lot of micro seismic events. So there is a very rich micro seismic information. Uh, on the other hand, there are some formations in which um, it, it doesn't work very well. And uh, unfortunately, if you are the first operator uh, to frack uh, a particular formation, uh, then uh, you don't really know whether it's going to be successful or not. I mean, that, that, that's my experience. Um, so there is no real um, way for us in advance to say, okay, this is going to be successful. I mean, in some formations, uh, we, we, we now can, you know, in, in Canada and the US, because some formations have been drilled uh, uh, thousands of times. Uh, so, for example, in the mountain, we know, okay, it's going to be successful. We, we know that by experience. In the Eagle Ford, it's going to be successful. Uh, in the Permian, uh, it's probably not going to be successful. Uh, so in, in a country that is new, at least for us, uh, Baker Hughes, uh, such as Indonesia, uh, we, we know that there are some factors of success. Like for example, the, uh, you know, a higher pump rate is, uh, is better. Uh, a longer stage duration is, is uh, better, but still we can give no guarantee uh, in advance. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Very good. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. And now maybe we can move to uh, proceed to the uh, next question. Yeah, any question from uh, 
Belladonna ya from Pertamina. Bella, you are still with us. So you do you want to just directly or uh, yes, right? Read your message. If you want to address directly, you can open your mic. Okay, maybe so. If if not the case, so I will uh, read maybe your question. Belladonna uh, from Pertamina. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm just wondering what do you think about the microseismic response? If we have natural fracture shear slippage away from the horizontal well. So, so Emma, Emma, it's me. Uh, is, 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 is the question clear or for you? Uh, no, I, I don't think I, I got the question totally. Can you repeat? Uh... Okay. Uh, question is about uh, what do you think about the micro seismic response if we have a natural fracture, shear slippage away from the horizontal well? Oh, um, uh, there, there is a chance that, that uh, this fault is going to be, could be reactivated. Uh, so uh, I think, I mean, uh, th this could be part of the design study uh, to, you know, do some bit of geomechanical modeling uh, and then determine what is the, the likelihood that this uh, fault is is going to be uh, to be uh, to be reactivated. So that that's a fault. If you're just talking about natural fractures, like so small fractures, uh, this is uh, usually a good thing for uh, micro seismic monitoring uh, because it creates uh, lots of uh, lots of micro seismic events. Uh, now maybe we can proceed because actually in the in the chat we have many uh, many questions now yeah? and maybe now uh, I will still continue a uh, question in in the chat now uh, the second question from Debbie yeah Debbie Halinda from Pertamina so uh, maybe I will share also maybe yeah? this very long question maybe I will share uh, in the screen can I uh, or maybe uh, okay maybe this is the question. In case also, if you want to uh, address directly, you can you can speak. Yeah. Yes, please. May I to speak yeah, yeah. directly to Emma, yeah. please? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, very nice and amazing presentation, actually, from you, uh, Emma. Uh, I'm Debbie from uh, Pertamina. Uh, in my question, say that uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we are here predominantly uh, completed as a vertical wells, in which in, in several case studies that you presented uh, just uh, minutes ago, uh, we are seeing a horizontal with a horizontal sta uh, multi-stage horizontal fracturing. So uh, my question is, uh, what I saw from one of your case studies in tight carbonate, I'm not so sure whether that is a vertical or horizontal wells, uh, in my point of view, well, correct me if I'm wrong, shows that uh, it looked like I saw like a one side fracturing wing. So my curiosity for the operations that you perform in that wells is how many monitoring wells that you were using on that operations uh, specifically. And uh, for your advice, uh, what would be the optimum uh, how many monitoring wells that you suggest to give optimum results for performing the micro seismic monitoring? And the second one is how far is the monitoring wells from the treated wells that would give, uh, would deliver also the best result for the, uh, in terms of the micro seismic, uh, seism micro seismicity events. So I think that's the questions from me. Uh, I hope uh, that can catch you well. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your question and your nice words. Um, so yes, most of our case studies come from North America, uh, where they use uh, massively, um, you know, horizontal wells, very long horizontal wells. But I would say that all the results I presented uh, are valid for uh, vertical wells. Uh, in fact, up to maybe five or ten years ago, most of the wells were uh, vertical wells. 
so uh, everything applies, I, I would say, to, to vertical wells. Now, uh, for the monitoring uh, wells, I, I would say that um, a good rule of thumb would be that you need to be uh, no further away than uh, 500 meters from the, the treated well uh, to have good results. So what happens after 500 meters, like it's not a sharp uh, boundary, of course, but uh, the further away you, 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 uh, you are from the, the treated well, I mean, sorry, from the monitoring well, uh, the higher is the position uh, uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, X, Y, Z. So it's, uh, let's say, typically 10% or a bit less than 10%, 5 to 10% of, of the distance. You can take this uh, rule of thumb. Uh, so 5% of, uh, of 500 meters is, is 25 meters. Uh, which in terms of depth can be can be quite important. So for example, if you want to to check that your uh, frac is remaining in into the reservoir, uh, then a, a 25 meter uncertainty on, on the depth is already uh, important. So rule of thumb is that uh, I think you should be uh, no further away than uh, 500 meters from from the treated well. Uh, now, usually we just use uh, one monitor well uh, because it would be quite a, a luxury uh, to use uh, two tools at the same time to monitor the, the, you know, the same frag. I, I know that it's been done in some cases, we, we've done that ourselves, but there were very specific applications, so it's, it's really not uh, typical. Uh, now, what you can do is uh, instead is like is move your tool from one observation well to to, to the other. But uh, if you if you're monitoring vertical wells, it, it doesn't really make sense. So uh, just pick the, the the closest monitoring well that you have, uh, and uh, you know hopefully it should be uh, no more than uh, five hundred meters away. Thank you, Emma. I think I get your answer very well. And uh, hopefully soon in here in Indonesia, we could have more uh, macro seismic job that could be applied in our hydraulic fracturing operations. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, thank you. So of course, you know, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me, uh, to my uh, Baker Hughes colleagues in Indonesia, if you need uh, a more in-depth uh, or personalized presentation. Okay. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, actually, this is uh, my first experience. Yeah, I become a moderator. So uh, now, now I will proceed to the next question from Andre Halim. Yeah, and I will maybe I will show in the screen the question. Now, actually, we have. Uh, about more uh, four, yeah, four questions to go. Yeah, now uh, from And Andre Halin. Yeah, the question is: uh, It is a good question. Uh, what What is the effect of noise during processing of the micro seismic yeah, to the to the result, especially in fracturing application, geothermal reservoir monitoring, monitoring yeah, production? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for this question, which uh, is quite important. Um, so the, the noise is, uh, is really an issue when you do uh, surface uh, frag monitoring, um, be because the noise at the surface can uh, vary uh, uh, really a lot between one location and the other. I mean, you can easily uh, multiply the noise by a, a factor of 1000. Uh, by picking the wrong location. Um, and that's why we uh, advocate the use of the, the patch deployment for surface, you know, so this group of geophones that we, we, we deploy together. And what is uh, critically important is to pick uh, the right location for these patches, so to put them in a low noise uh, environment. So you need to keep away uh, from uh, uh, you know, in industrial plants, uh, from power lines, uh, 
and uh, you know a, a, any source of noise. So the, the deployment of these uh, surface arrays is, is important. You, you need to have an experienced uh, crew or an experienced supervisor uh, to put these geophones in, in, in quiet areas. Uh, so that's, that's really important for surface micro seismic um, imaging. For the downhole part, it's, uh, it's less important because uh, as soon as you put the, the geophones into the deep borehole, uh, then they are screened from the surface noise. So usually uh, we, we get a very low noise uh, in, in downhole monitoring, uh, which is also the reason uh, why we get uh, more micro seismic info. Well, typically we get more micro seismic events from uh, down down hole monitoring than from the surface one. Yeah. Okay, so it, yeah, can now we proceed to maybe the next question from Erlanga from Pertamina. Eh? Is it possible to use this methodology to also delineate the effective fracture network? Eh? Connected fractured in naturally fractured basement reservoir. For example, in ATOS is a good placement for development well. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to answer it. Uh, I think uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's an important question, uh, which just straddles, I think, uh, micro seismic uh, and uh, geomechanics. So um, I think to, to get a, a really good answer on this, I would have to consult with my geomechanics colleagues. So I, 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 I uh, I suppose that you're referring to permanent monitoring, not uh, you know, not uh, fracturing imaging. Uh, so, yeah, the question is uh, my, my understanding of your question is: Can we use permanent monitoring to get uh, uh, to get the, you know the background um, or the image of the, the seismic activity and then uh, deduce the um, uh, delineate the, the, the fractures in the basement? Um, I can't answer this question. I'm sorry. So I have to get back to you. If you if you can send me your question through an email, uh, I will consult with my colleagues and and uh, answer your question. Okay. Or maybe now, if uh, Perlanga want to say something here, now you can address directly here to, to Emma. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Uh, yeah, I will, I will send the emails because uh, in Indonesia and. Uh, and generally in South, uh, Southeast Asia, we have a lot of like uh, a new prospect in uh, a fracture basement. And uh, by seeing your presentation, I think it's it could be it could be possible to 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 maybe delineate the um, a connecting uh, a fracture there. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's depend on the uh, the depth of the target also. Yes, that, that could be one difficulty because if you're talking a basement, then it's it's going to be probably quite deep. Yeah, uh, and also the availability of the of the uh, downhole monitoring. Uh, well, probably because uh, maybe some of of them is on uh, still in the uh, exploration stage, so there is no not many wells there. Yes, I mean, I, I can see uh, two potential issues here. Um, is that a, a deep, because we, we're probably looking at a small or not very large micro seismic events. Um, so, you know, the, the deep borehole well is going to allow you to image a, a small part of the basement. Uh, and therefore, it seems, you know, like a priori, my, my first idea is that you, you would need uh, so many wells to efficiently cover, uh, you know, the, the area of interest, which, which, which might be an obstacle. Yeah, maybe uh, we have Paromi here. Paromi, you can jump in to give a comment on this, please. Paromi Sagita. Since I see uh, Paromi Sagita is uh, from Geomechanics as well, right? Yes. yes you, you want to give a comment on this one, please? Uh, 
Yeah, I think he's muting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I hope it will, uh, in the future, it will be possible. I mean, like um, maybe it will be open a, a new opportunity for uh, like a new res research for that. Yeah, okay. So, you know, if you can send me an email, maybe I'll consult with my geomechanical, geomechanics colleagues okay. and, you know, maybe yeah. give you a more satisfying answer. I'm sorry, okay. uh, I can't be... Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, maybe Payar Langka can continue yeah, the discussion uh, through email. And then now we have a question from Pahari. Yeah, Hari. And it is a question. Uh, if if Ahari want to speak directly, also it is welcome. Yeah? Uh, this, uh, two questions, I think, from Ahari. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Emmanuel. I we like we have a deep well which is more than four thousand meter, but in, and then is Jurassic uh, Reservoir and. Uh, nearby well is quite far, probably more than one kilometer or two kilometers. So, do you have any solution for that one? Probably like uh, putting a tool on top of the treatment well, or maybe like a fiber optic behind the cemented casing. Um, yes. So, uh, the, the the fiber optics uh, behind the casing is definitely a solution. Um, yeah, I would say it's a partial solution because the fiber optics can uh, only help you determine the depth of the micro seismic events uh, mm -hmm. and not the X and Y position. Mm -hmm. So it would probably give you uh, uh, some information on the, the thickness, like the depth uh, of the, the treatment. Uh, but you wouldn't be uh, able to determine the, the azimuth uh, and the extension of the frac, uh, unless you use uh, two wells. So if you have, uh, but well, so you're thinking fiber optics in, in the treated well. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, fiber optic in the treated well, but then in the upper section of the, this uh, uh, treated uh, reservoir, uh, you mentioned that uh, we can get the, the event, but then we don't get the azimuth or the direction, something like that. Yes, so you're going to run into another challenge is that um, because of the injection, you're going to have a lot of noise in, in, uh, in the treated well, uh, which means that mm -hmm. you, you're going to see fewer micro seismic events than, than you would in, if you had deployed the fiber optics in, uh, in, a, in another well. Uh, so you, you can try this. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be successful. Uh, the other option is to go with, uh, with the surface micro seismic. So uh, it, it is very deep, uh, but uh, hydraulic fracturing, a uh, surface hydraulic fracturing imaging is known to work at uh, uh, 30,000 30, feet, which is uh, you know, close to 4,000 4, meters. It, it really depends on the formation, like some formations uh, have such uh, a, a large micro seismic response that you can uh, you can detect them from the surface, and then um, so I assume this is for Kuwait. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's probably going to be a desert environment, which uh, which is uh, which is good for you know surface deployment, because there there isn't a lot of noise and it's also. Uh, easy and cheap in, in Kuwait to deploy uh, uh, surface uh, geophones. Like you have lots then of it will be need, um, Yeah, but then it will be need a very good uh, modeling in terms of whether we will get the signal or something like that. Is, is, is there any modeling capable of, uh, I mean, predicting or, I mean, how, how big is the seismicity that we will get? No, I, I mean, unfortunately, uh, we, we can't predict uh, the response of a particular formation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, as I was saying previously, that there are some factors that are conducive to macro seismicity. 
uh, large injection rates, uh, large stage duration, but it mainly yeah, depends yeah, yeah. on the, the response of the formation. Uh, so because you're a national oil company, uh, you, you should be, I'm sure you're aware of any uh, hydraulic fracture monitoring that has been done on, on this formation in, in, in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe the same formation uh, has been, uh, you know, fracked in, in neighboring countries. So it might be another mm -hmm. source of information. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Yeah, thanks for your question. And now next question is from Chahyo. Uh, Pacha from Patamina, so uh, uh, in the text it's very long, yeah? maybe Pacha also want to speak directly. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Well. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it is a great presentation for me. Uh, so I have a question about the arrangement of the equipment. Uh, let's say we have only uh, surface equipment or surface seismometers. Let's say only 12 uh, seismometers. And then we would like to monitor the hydraulic fracturing within a vertical well with the reservoir depth about 1,000 meter. What is your recommendation for the arrangement? Is it uh, better to combine several geophone or several seismometers in several places? Or we spread all 12 seismometers in different places. And then what is the distance or the maximum distance from the wellhead? And uh, my second question is about the range of the seismicity magnitude for the induced uh, fracture from the hydraulic fracturing activity from the reservoir depth of about 1000 meter to your knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Um, so my recommendation, if you have only 12 seismometers, uh, is to um, bury them. Yeah, like uh, to make most of your seismometers, you're going to uh, deploy them in the least uh, noisy situation possible. So you need to uh, pick very, very quiet locations. Um, so for example, fields, uh, far, far away from any road or any, uh, any industry or any human activities, any power lines. Uh, then you need to bury the seismometers. Uh, maybe one, one meter is, is already good. So it really makes a difference. Like between uh, zero and, and one meter, you, you already see uh, quite a large uh, diminution of the surface noise. Uh, and, and then you need to uh, you, you need to spread these uh, 12 seismometers to a, a distance of about uh, 1,000 meters from the well. So like the rule of thumb is, is to use uh, a radius of deployment that is about equal to uh, the target depth. So that you, your maximum uh, angle is going to be uh, larger than 45 degrees. So imagine you have this uh, disc uh, of a one kilometer radius. Uh, and then you, you try to spread your 12 seismometers uh, evenly uh, on this disk, but by picking a very, very quiet locations. So the, the, the most important thing here is, uh, is quiet, quiet locations. And then for your second questions, uh, the, the minimum magnitude that we, de that we detect uh, is magnitude minus two or minus three, but minus three magnitudes, uh, it means uh, that you're very, very close to, uh, to the monitoring system. Um, uh, and then there is no, I mean, if you, if you, um, if you reactivate a launch fault, then you can potentially induce a, a magnitude 4, uh, 4 4.1 uh, events. That, that, that's, that's what occurred in, in Canada. So that, that's the range, like minus three, like in ideal locations, uh, to magnitude uh, plus four, uh, which, by the way, is, is an enormous range of uh, energy. 
Okay, uh, very clear. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, actually, I search uh, through the chat. Actually, no, uh, no question anymore yeah, from the participants, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so please now, if any of you still have a question, you can uh, open your mic now from participant. <clears throat> Emma, I have a question, Andre. Yes, yes, please. So in case we interesting with these uh, services, do we have this tool in town? I mean, in Indonesia, Emma? Oh, I'm sure that you have uh, seismic acquisition companies. I mean, wherever you have um, oil and gas production, you have uh, seismic acquisition companies to do 2D seismic or 3D seismic. Uh, it's exactly the same hardware. Uh, what is different is the way that they are deployed. And uh, we, we can find a, a subcontractor uh, and we can uh, supervise them for uh, surface micro seismic acquisition. Okay, okay. And then my second question, how about the calibration with it within a different different vendor from the seismic acquisition? Is that uh, will give uh, any impact any impact to the to the measurement? Uh, do you mean the calibration of the geophones? Yes. No, it, it doesn't really it it has almost uh, I mean no no influence. Um, we, we use a very standard, um, you know, land acquisition uh, geophones. Uh, some of them are calibrated, others are not. Um, we, we are not looking at uh, very detailed uh, information on, on amplitudes. Uh, so, you know, just the basic uh, standard equipment is, is enough. What, 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 is, what is going to make a difference uh, between the vendors is in the way uh, the geophones are deployed. Uh, and that's why I would recommend to have uh, an experienced um, surface micro seismic party chief or, or advisor uh, supervise or at least uh, advise on, on, um, uh, on the deployment in the field. And, and we can provide this type of, uh, of personnel. Okay, uh, thanks, Emma. Yeah. Yep, now we have, yes, we have still a uh, time now. So, I mean, yeah. Actually, if no question from participant, I have some question, actually, yeah, if, if it's okay. And actually, in, uh, in your uh, slide, maybe about 13, yeah, and you, you, you make a clustering or a classification, yeah, with event, yeah. Uh, between CO2 clusters and natural and etc. And I'm wondering how uh, how did you do that? Yeah, how how did you make clustering uh, or, or maybe classify? Yeah, how do you how did you classify the event? Okay, this event, uh, for example, due to CO2 uh, injection or the others maybe related with uh, natural earthquake. Maybe about 13, yeah, 13. But... Oh, yeah, that's for permanent monitoring. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's purely based on distance, uh, distance, uh, depth, uh, and magnitude. So, um, you know, the, uh, the injection, the CO2 injection was, uh, was occurring in one particular location. You see, the, for this region 11, the, the closest ones, Okay. Uh, were occurring at uh, 30 kilometers, mm. uh, sorry, three kilometers. Uh, and, and then it's also a question of depth. So when, when you have an event that is uh, located at uh, 10 kilometer depth, uh, then it's, it, it's probably uh, not related to the injection that is occurring at uh, 4,500 meters. Mm. I mean, it could be, but in that case, it wasn't. So, yeah. So in, so in your opinion, uh, for example, the, if we have, let's say we have some earthquake yeah, with uh, maybe significant magnitude, but the distance quite far yeah, from the injection point. So the, this earthquake may be not uh, related with the uh, injection, yeah, with induce, if the distance is far from the injection point. 
Yes, it's the distance, uh, the magnitude, uh, and the depth. So in, in that case, it was pretty clear because uh, it's also related to a mountain range. Uh, so it's close to the, the Pyrenees, uh, which is a, you know, a mountain range in, in Southwest France. So there was a clear explanation for, for this, a clear uh, natural explanation uh, for these events. In some other situations, uh, the, the explanation might not be as clear. Um, for example, in, in Texas, uh, in, the, in the United States, they inject a lot of uh, wastewater and this wastewater, as you may know, is uh, triggering a lot of seismicity, mm -hmm. uh, even at a very significant distance from the injection wells, and also at uh, quite different depth. Uh, but uh, let's say this, this is a, a real different uh, situation. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's say in, in some example, yeah, uh, Actually, a couple, a couple, maybe a couple of weeks ago, eh, in some area, and it is Asia thermal area, and uh, some uh, in uh, some people, yeah, in, in uh, close to the uh, thermal field, uh, feels some uh, earthquake, yeah, maybe significant about four or yeah, six, yeah. and people close uh, close to the thermal field. Uh, Things, yeah, they thought that oh, maybe this is related with the geothermal activity, but it in this case how uh, how to for example how to clarify yeah? how to I mean how to uh, identify okay this is the event not related with our activity. Yeah? Yes, uh, it, I I understand that that's the issue with a lot of projects. Uh, in in Europe, uh, you know, whenever you do something uh, in the underground, now that there is a, a potential that uh, that the population is going to protest uh, because mm -hmm. of the use seismicity risk. Um, so I think that the one part of the answer uh, is first to monitor the the seismicity uh, and to have your own result. Um, if you're relying on the national seismic survey. Uh, you have, uh, um, I shouldn't say that, but some kind of, uh, you know, inaccurate results because by nature, seismic surveys are focused on very large events. And so they have a sparse uh, distribution of sensors and therefore mm -hmm. there is, uh, the, the, their location is uh, mm -hmm. inaccurate. I mean, for the National Seismic Survey, it's quite okay to have a, 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 an accuracy of, uh, five kilometers, you know, it's mm -hmm. more than enough for them. But for an operator like a geothermal operator, underground gas storage, five kilometers is not enough because mm -hmm. it makes the difference between, oh, it's in my field or it's outside my field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so first of all, you need to have your own uh, mm -hmm. micro seismic equipment uh, so that you can not only have better locations, uh, and then second, so that you can have more sensitive uh, um, equipment and then uh, more and better information. So the idea I think is that you need to detect uh, the weak micro seismic events uh, before anyone can detect them. So you, you are the, uh, I would say that, you, you are the first to know, okay? Mm. Uh, and so if you realize that your geothermal operation is um, starting to trigger small seismicity, like very small seismicity, nobody but you uh, can measure the seismicity, then you're still in time uh, to modify some things in, in your operation. So for example, you're going to, to change uh, injection rates, so or you're going to you know, change the location of the few wells. You're going to do your stuff and nobody cares because nobody is feeling the micro seismic event. So that's the proactive, uh, uh, let's say a proactive methodology of uh, dealing with uh, induced seismicity. Once the induced or once the seismicity it might not even be induced, but once it is felt by the population, uh, it's already too late. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And 
actually maybe next two slide yeah, from this. Uh, actually, I remember in your 13 yeah, number slide, uh, there is a cluster, if it's an event, uh, belong to CO2, yeah, uh, uh, red, uh, the color is red, but the magnitude, magnitude is about one, yeah, close, close uh, very close to one, yeah, at, at the beginning yes. of your injection. So this is, yeah. uh, the, the location, this is at, uh, correspond to some fault or? Oh, yes, oh, all these micro seismic events correspond uh, to the faults that uh, are here. You see on, on this uh, mm. geological cross-section, so e each of the uh, micro seismic events that are shown here uh, were occurring on these faults that were identified uh, around the reservoir. Okay, so the magnitude also close to uh, na natural uh, earthquake. Yeah? The, the well, it's, it's debatable. Uh, okay, so um, I'm not going to enter into the debate, but uh, let's just say that uh, the operator is uh, sure that they were not induced by, uh, by their operations. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the critical fact here is if you look at the timeline on, on the mm. left-hand diagram, uh, we started the monitoring about one year, uh, six months, I think, before the injection. And, mm. and we did detect a few events, uh, mm. two of them before the injection. So that's the reason why the operator says, okay, this, this you know, seismicity was not induced by, by the injection. And mm. uh, I think it's a very important lesson that we learned is that uh, mm. before you possibly, possibly if you have the possibility, uh, you, you should start the micro seismic monitoring before you mm. do anything. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your uh, answer and uh, your explanation. Next, uh, we have uh, two minutes yeah, to the end of uh, our web webinar, but uh, I believe uh, we have another agenda yeah, for the session, I think, yeah. Because also no question, yeah, I think for participant, yeah. No question from participant. And then again, thank you very much, yeah, uh, Emma. We have now a very fruitful, uh, fruitful discussion, yeah. Uh, and then uh, thank you so much again. And then maybe I am giving uh, the floor to Jupe uh, yeah, to uh, you, you please. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and thank you everybody for your attention and, and your questions. So thank you, Pandi, feel, free, feel free to come back to me or to my Baker Hughes colleagues if you have further questions. Sure, sure. So now I'm inviting to all uh, participants to open the camera. So let's uh, have uh, some photo session to all participants. It's very interesting topic and hopefully uh, we can get the benefit and to all of uh, audience, if you still have any question later on, you can uh, reach down to Emma. So still waiting, a uh, couple seconds. Everybody, please uh, open the camera. And there is another uh, geomechanic question. Maybe later on, Bang Romi, you can directly uh, reply Mas Erlangga question. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Mas Erlangga. Actually, I, I had an issue with my uh, uh, laptop while using a Zoom. So maybe we can in touch uh, uh, yeah. for this, Mas Erlangga. Okay, I will email you, Mas Romi. Thank you. Okay, no worry, Mas. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me count it down. One, two... Okay, one more, one, two, three. Okay, again, thanks to all our participants. Uh, good, good night, and please be safe in this uh, pandemic COVID-19 situation.
So see you guys in another uh, ISPG webinar session. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Emma. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good day for everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good weekend. I'll see you, Emma. Thank you, Emmanuel, and thank you, SPG, as well, for a good uh, session. Thanks, Masari. Yeah.